Um, thank you. Um, um, as I uh, forecasted this morning, uh, this paper is to provide another explanation for the uh, wage growth, especially after the year 2003. So a well-known uh, phenomenon is ever since the year 2003, wage has risen very quickly. Uh, I cite paper by uh, Taipan and Zhu Yang here. And um, I think there are two kinds of wage growth, actually, in, in economic development. One is productivity-based, which is not bad, right? The wage reflects the uh, growth of productivity. But if there are, uh, there are anything uh, which pushes up the uh, uh, wage, uh, which uh, deviates from uh, productivity growth, which is uh, uh, very uh, harmful for the economic development, this is the story I will uh, tell from the land policy uh, uh, issue. So this is another paper I cite by uh, Zhang Xiaobo, showing that there is a very uh, sharp change in the, uh, wage growth using a uh, rural uh, data, showing that ever since the year 2003, you, you can see the wage growth uh, very uh, a, a very sharp change. And the uh, question is whether this is a Lewis turning point issue. Um, if, we, if you think this is a Lewis turning point, the question is uh, the labor shortage uh, happened in the year 2003 when our urbanization ratio was only uh, far below uh, half of the uh, population. And urban rural income ratio was even higher than three. So that's very odd that we have seen Lewis turning point, but still we have uh, only less than half of people living in the urban area. And the urban rural income ratio is very uh, high. And uh, the urban rural income ratio uh, just began to uh, drop ever since the year two, uh, 2009, uh, more than six years later uh, than the Lewis turning point. So this is very uh, hard to explain by the uh, Lewis turning point theory. So uh, we need to think uh, what had happened in the year 2003. Uh, in this paper, I want to address one thing which is very important in the year 2003, which is the land policy. In the year 2003, we had uh, stricter management of the construction land quota. Um, it means that it is uh, more difficult for the local governments to change their agriculture use land to non-agriculture use. The second is the sales method. We began to use more listing, bidding, and auction to reflect the de relationship between demand and supply. And third is structure. This is the most important thing here, because ever since that year, the central government used their land policy to encourage the uh, inland area to develop their local economy by giving them more land use quota. In China, we, you know, we don't have the uh, private land ownership. So the land supply at local level is controlled by the central government. So if you want to convert your agriculture use land into non-agriculture use land, you need to have a quota. The quota is set by the central government and then distributed from the central government to the provincial level and the city level and then county level. So this is actually exogenously determined by the uh, government. So ever since the year 2003, they changed the distribu spatial distribution of the, this, land, this land quota. I will show you some uh, uh, data to be the evidence. So the question we, ans we ask in this paper is, did this uh, uh, change of the land policy will change the housing price, and housing price will affect the wage growth ever since the year 2003? If this is true, is there any difference of the mechanism between the east part of China or the, uh, and the inland? But the question, uh, our answer to the question is, housing prices significantly raised wages, especially after the year 2003, and especially in the uh, coastal area coastal area where the uh, lab, uh, land supply was restricted by the land supply uh, policy change. The wage here is nominal wage. Everything is nominal. Everything is nominal here. Uh, can you? If, I, if, I if I need to deflate the wage, I also need to deflate the uh, housing price. And on, the, on both hand side of the uh, equation, that's the same change, right? And so this won't change. Uh, housing price grows faster than, than the wage. Yeah. I will show you the uh, figure. You will see that. So this is a typical you know, wage housing price interaction relationship in the identification. So here we have uh, both wage and housing price. So you, you can very easily understand that there are two way causalities. Wage, will, uh, wage growth will increase the uh, 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 demand of housing so that will increase the housing price. But housing price as a cost of living, the most important cost of living, if this rises, it will constrain the labor inflow. So the labor supply will be reduced in the, in the area where the housing price is rising faster. So this will reduce the labor supply and then cause the uh, wage growth. So this is a challenge for our identification. So, so before I show you the identification, uh, identification of the paper, I show you some uh, 
uh, phenomenon, <laughs> the uh, facts of the uh, uh, policy change. So this is uh, the inland provinces share in land supply in our, uh, in our data set. You can see there is a very uh, significant change in the year 2003. Ever since that year, the overall trend of the shares in the inland province uh, is rising. So they got, I, I mean, they got more and more land supply relatively to the uh, uh, eastern part of China. And uh, in the uh, latest year, in this in here, they got 45 percent. Uh, uh, 2001 is not important for us. We uh, we address the change of 2003. So this is the first year. The first year of the land, uh, land supply change. This could, this could be because that the eastern part of China, they grow faster, they need more land. So the share of the inland, they uh, drop. Right? This, this is a share. This is an area term. Area term, yes. This is an area term. So before that, I mean, the inland province get a smaller share of land supply. But ever since then, you know, their share is rising. I mean, the total land supply. And in this year, their land share is 45%, but their GDP share is only 40% as time goes by. And this is a, a figure for you to see the correlation between the wage level and uh, uh, the uh, housing price level in our data set. So I divide our sample into two groups. The, 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 the green one, the green group represents the inland provinces. And the blue group represents the coastal provinces. And this uh, lines, two lines, fit the uh, relationship between, between these two variables. So uh, across time, you can see that the yellow line is very stable across time, right? Very stable. But if you look at the red line, the uh, housing price rises much faster in the uh, coastal area compared with the uh, inland uh, area. Uh, uh, wage, wage data is the uh, uh, average worker's wage in the statistical yearbook. Housing price is uh, the housing price we can calculate according to the uh, uh, sales of the uh, housing uh, area and the sales total. So we divide, we divide the, What's the, data? the data source is the uh, 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 regional statistical yearbook. That's, that's true, that's true, that's true. But this uh, study uh, depends on, you know, both across time and across uh, space change of the uh, housing price. We use the city level. But if you, if you think that the uh, uh, housing price is uh, uh, underestimated, you can only, uh, you know, question our result by assuming that some regions un underestimate the housing price even more seriously. Could be. <laughs> this is the best answer I can give. Yeah. So these data points are housing prices, average wage in, at a point in time. Uh, yes. Yes. The same year, the same time, the same place. Yeah, we draw the correlation between these two variables. Right. Be because in this, uh, in this uh, study, we have to have the you know, cross-regional, cross-city comparison. So we have to construct a, uh, a panel data for all the uh, cities we have. Data is really a problem because it, the next question you will raise is whether we need to use housing price data or rent of the housing. Uh, uh, but the answer is very easy. We don't have rent at the uh, city level to construct the panel data. So we, this is why we use housing price. And this is another uh, 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 figure I want to show. Uh, this is the rate in our data set. This is the ratio of housing price to wage. East, East China versus England. So you can see that before the year 2003, this ratio, uh, they dropped together. So because across time this is dropped, maybe this is because of the underestimation of the housing price, as uh, uh, you said. Because if you, how, if you have a how higher housing price, this ratio will, will rise. But if you, if you see that across time, these two lines, they deviate from each other ever since the year 2003. I mean, in the eastern part of China, the housing price to wage ratio rise even faster, then you can believe that this uh, makes sense because of the uh, 
policy change, also consistent with the observation I have presented uh, earlier. So now the consequences, before I show my identifi identification, I mean, why this is important? If the story I tell is, uh, is true, then I think there are two kinds of wage growth. The first is based on labor productivity growth. So this is good, so that you, can, you need to upgrade your industry, right? The, the other thing is, if there is something which uh, raised the housing price and raised the cost of living in the cities where they have inflow of labor, this will make this housing price deviate from the uh, labor productivity. So this wage growth will deviate from this labor productivity, productivity, which will lead to too early industrial upgrading and excessive capital deepening. So this is uh, uh, the logic behind this uh, story, which is uh, what I want to show. So if this is true, this is very dangerous, because this means that China has uh, uh, given up our labor-intensive industry's uh, comparative advantage too early. Right, so this is the meaning of this paper. And then I build a model. I want to skip this to uh, save time because the model is very simple. We don't have any contribution to theory. The story in this is very, very easy. It means that in the uh, area where you have labor inflow, but you restrict land supply, then the land supply will grow, much, uh, will grow less faster than the labor demand. So the land Land price will go up. Land price will go up, then housing price will go up. It will restrict labor inflow. Then wage will go up. Right? So this is a very simple uh, spatial equilibrium model. I will skip this. Right? And then let me show more details about the uh, uh, empirical part of the uh, question. So the, the challenge to the identification of the housing price wage relationship is the endogeneity. So uh, you mean, <laughs> I mean, the, there is. Of course, two-way causality between housing price and wage. And the other thing is maybe housing price represent many things you need to control, right? So how to identif identify the uh, key uh, uh, method we use is the instrumental variable plus border sample identification. What does that mean? Uh, I, as I have said, there is two-way causality relationship between these two variables. So if I can find the instrumental variable, then I can uh, solve this endogeneity issue. The instrumental variable here I use for housing price is the per capita land supply in the previous year. I mean, this year's uh, land supply will affect next year's housing price. The question you will raise is, this can represent many things like economic development. So there are two things I will do in this paper. The first thing is to control as much as we can at the city level to avoid that this IV will be uh, correlated with the uh, unobservables in the uh, error term. The other thing here is, we need to uh, kill the uh, channel that the instrumental variable here will directly affect the wage here if this is correlated to the uh, error term, even if after controlling for those control variables in the paper. Then we use the border sample. I will show you, uh, because the policy change is uh, uh, significantly to encourage the western and central province to develop. So the central government's policy is to reduce the land supply in the uh, eastern provinces, but to in increase the land supply in the uh, middle and western uh, provinces. So we choose the border sample just on the border between the inland provinces and uh, the western provinces. Just assuming that this uh, province, uh, these cities actually, on the border are just like twins. <laughs> they are very similar to each other, right? So this is our identification strategy. So before doing that, I want to clarify one thing. Uh, I said that the land supply is exogenous, but actually we don't have the most exogenous land supply variable, which is the um, construction uh, uh, land use quota. Construction land use quota can only be found in the, st in the statistical yearbook ever since the year 2003. But I need to compare before and after 2003 change. So what we really have is the land supply. So the first thing I need to show is, I need to show the high correlation between the land supply I have at city level and the construction land quota we can find after the year 2003 uh, by using this figure. So I add up all the land supply to, from the city level to the provincial level. And then I correlate them with the uh, uh, approved uh, construction land use quota uh, set by the uh, central government. You can see uh, during this uh, data period for those eight years, they are highly correlated. And then I do another thing. 
This blue line represents the uh, inland province's share in the reported uh, construction land quota, which is really exogenous. And this red line represents the land supply in my data to add up at the uh, provincial level. So you can see that these two variables actually change together. So these two things confirm that even if you can argue that the instrumental variable I use is not that exogenous, but it's highly correlated, correlated with the real exogenous policy variable, which is the construction um, uh, uh, land use quota. But uh, you know, as I said, we only have those exogenous, real exogenous variable at provincial level, and af only after the year 2003, we cannot use this to compare before and after 2003 change of the policy. This is the policy change. I mean, I mean, what just this is this is the marginally increased supply of land. It means when they want to control the land supply, they can only during that year they can only you know supply the land to those you know inland provinces, but compress the land supply in the eastern provinces. And in that year, 2003, one thing happened, which is the closure of development zones. In that year, the central government saw that we, we had too many development zones. And the central government saw that we need to close them. They closed 70% of development zones. And most of the development zones closed in that year were in the eastern part of China. This is one, this is one of the reasons why you know, the more you know, the incremental land supply was uh, given more towards the inland provinces. Right? So the most sharp change was in the year 2003. And I say that this is an overall time uh, change across time. Yeah. I mean, the land quota, the land quota itself is exogenous. Yeah, th this is what I try to do next. First is to control as much as I can, which is uh, doubted to affect the land use quota. The second thing is I only use the data on the border by assuming that it's on the border, the cities are very similar to each other. So this is why I instrument the, the housing price using land supply, assuming that given the demand side, which is controlled by the co those control variable, the land supply will change the housing price. And then the housing price will restrict the uh, labor inflow and then change the wage. That's the causality I want to establish. All right, let me go on, OK? Go on. OK, and this is the uh, ratio of another, of another variable, which is the ratio of land supply per capita. Before I showed the land supply in the province divided by the total land supply in that year. This is the land supply per capita, but I calculate the ratio. Land supply per capita in the east versus the land supply per capita in the inland provinces. Even if I use this, you still see a change in the year 2003. I mean, after that year, the per capita land supply is shrinking across time relatively in the eastern part of China. And then this is the regression model. The regression model is very simple. On the left-hand side, it's a wage in long term. And on the right-hand side, we have a housing price. And to control for those city-level variables, uh, reflecting those uh, uh, demand-side variables, you will see a list of uh, variables I, uh, of the uh, I control in the model. And then the first stage of the uh, estimation is housing price is determined by the instrumental variable I use. Here, of course, I need to control those uh, city variables. So this is the first thing I, want, I can do with the data set, which means that I, I, I control as much as city level variables to, con to convince that the uh, uh, variations here I use is uh, from the policy control. So this is the first thing I can, I can do. So the control variables is uh, uh, a group of uh, variables uh, reflecting the 
economic development or economic structure. The first and most important thing, of course, is per capita GDP. So this largely captured the demand side theory, uh, demand side mechanism, right? So this is uh, the first thing I want to uh, show. And the second importance of this variable is, after controlling for per capita GDP, anything which makes the wage deviate from the uh, per capita GDP could be understood as some deviation from productivity growth. Right, so this is uh, uh, the importance of this variable. And of course, I also control for investment intensity, which is measure, measured by fixed asset investment over GDP ratio. Of course, the more uh, investment you have, the more uh, labor you will demand, which will also increase the wage. So this is a uh, uh, variable I control. Also, I also control industrial structure, which is the ratio of tertiary industry output to secondary industry output to, uh, rep uh, to represent the uh, demand structure of the uh, uh, economic development. I also control for employed density, which is measured by the number of staff from the secondary and tertiary industry over built up area. This variable has two channels. First is, this population density or employment density could increase labor productivity, which will increase wage. But on the other side, after controlling for per capita GDP, this is also a variable mirroring labor supply per area. So this also uh, lead to more uh, serious uh, competition between labors. So it will uh, uh, put a downward uh, pressure on wage growth. And then we also control for other things, including infrastructure, education. Education, we don't have for city level per capita schooling. So we measure education as a per capita number of teachers in high school as a proxy. I also control for transportation, environment, and medical. And uh, this variable uh, 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 also measure the amenities, uh, especially those uh, public services at city level. So this group of uh, control variables are those variables I can control as much as I can to convince that the uh, variation of the instrumental variable uh, I use is after controlling for these uh, control variables. So this is what I can do. And then uh, this is the explanation of the uh, uh, source of data I have explained uh, earlier. So now let us look at the first stage. This first stage shows that if you have a higher per capita ground land, you will have a lower housing price. This is for all the sample, for all the year. And this is only for the East, and this is for the inland. Very interesting, for both of the Eastern part of China, inland China, they have very similar coefficients here. But here, the coefficient is a little larger than this. I mean, land supply affects housing price. This coefficient is very, it's a little, smaller in the eastern part of China because here uh, they have higher population or building density. So you can build higher building to uh, you know, uh, confront the uh, uh, change of the supply of, uh, of land. Uh, uh, this means that if this is increased by uh, one kilometer squared per person, this will be The grant of land? Yeah. Typical, you mean level? Yeah. Do I multiply that by uh, I can't remember very precisely, but as I remember, this is uh, 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 kilometers uh, squared per capita. Yeah, but this is land supply, not housing. Let, let me answer this question during the break. I need to check my paper and data to see the, maybe the average of the uh, value of the per capita land. Uh, I, I used a log to uh, repeat the regression. The result doesn't change much, but the significance is lower. I mean here, right? This is his question. I used a log. I used a log once. The result doesn't change much, but the significance is lower. So uh, I use this uh, variable, which is not in long term, to increase the uh, first stage variation captured by the uh, instrumental variable. Right. And this is the second stage. In the second stage, you can see two results. First here, if you look at the uh, re regression results for the whole sample, 
is uh, significantly positive. It means that the housing price will raise the uh, uh, wage of, uh, of workers. But this is only significant in the eastern part of China, where the land supply is controlled. I mean, it's, it's everywhere is controlled, but this area experiences a, a shrink of the uh, land supply relatively to the inland provinces. So this is the first result I want to show. And the second result is, in the uh, second stage uh, uh, regression, I want to explain one thing. Because you if you observe the result, you can see that the employment density has a negative coefficient. As I have said, this employment density can have two channels uh, on wage. One is density increases labor productivity. It will increase wage. The other is it's a labor supply. So I mean, after controlling for per capita GDP here, which has a, a positive sign, then this becomes uh, negative. It means this is a labor supply effect. And so to give evidence here, I uh, drop per capita GDP to convince that if I drop this, this will become insignificant. It means what? It means the positive effects and the uh, negative effects will cancel each other. Right? So this is only to explain one thing, which is uh, not that reasonable uh, uh, with our. Uh, and then I divide our sample into before 2003 and after 2004 uh, period. You can see that uh, in the eastern part of China, only after 2004, when the land supply was uh, restrictedly uh, constrained, then this uh, positive coefficient. Uh, appears. And in the inland area where the land supply was not that toughly controlled, then every, any period is not significant. I mean, it's only significant in this period and in that uh, area. So this is first. More land, yes. I mean, in the year 2003, In the year 2003, two things changed. The first is, even before the year 2003, land was changed. Uh, land was regulated, but not that strictly. After, two year, after 2003, the land supply was strictly controlled by the central government. If you look at the uh, growth of the land supply, land supply growth dropped significantly after the year 2003. And at the same time, the central government gave more land use quota to the inland provinces to encourage their development. So two effects combined. Right. And um, um, this thing, OK, before showing this, you may question that this is not significant. Maybe this is only because then I skip. <laughs> I skip this. I skip. Then this is border. right? And then one thing very interesting, when I use this border, after 2003, in the eastern part of China, in the eastern part of China, which is right, right to the border, has a positive sign, but insignificant. T ratio is 1.2. Because Liaoning and Hebei, even though they are located in the eastern part of China, actually they enjoyed policy preferences just like middle provinces. Right? So when we drop these two provinces and their neighboring provinces, and I have <laughs> data showing that if I have only less than Liaoning and Hebei, their land supply share in the country actually increased. I mean, they are regarded as England provinces, actually. So when I drop this, you see here. I mean, this is the real, real Eastern China, right? So this is the result, key result. And other channels, I want to exclude this. Maybe you will ask whether this uh, faster rise of the uh, wage is only because of uh, per capita GDP uh, growth. The first point is, I have controlled that. Even if you question this is because of a per capita GDP growth, I show this. This is the eastern provinces' GDP uh, growth versus inland provinces' GDP growth. You can see when their wage growth is faster, actually their GDP growth was slower. Right? I mean, in the eastern part of China, they are experiencing relatively slower GDP growth, but faster wage growth. I will conclude. Just one minute. Minimum wage. This is the minimum wage change. This is Eastern. This is uh, England. I get a ratio. Eastern provinces versus England ratio of their average per minimum wage is even dropping across time. So it's not because of uh, 
Eastern provinces have a higher minimum wage growth, and then I control them. You can see that minimum wage for the whole sample is positive, but not significant. Highly significant for England provinces. So I mean, this is a bug. <laughs> for Eastern provinces, it's even negative. Here, I can only explain that we control too much variables, too many variables, especially the per capita GDP. But please notice that here, they have a very significant positive coefficient in England provinces. So I mean, in China now, in the coastal area, they're constrained by the land policy. Housing prices rises and pushes up the wage growth. And in the England provinces, they are not affected by the land, pro land policy, but they are more affected by the minimum wage. So everywhere, they are experiencing wage growth, deviating from the GDP growth, but because of different reasons, different policy reasons. So this is my argument. Then I can conclude. I also do some robust check to change the definition of IV, the change of the uh, policy variables, change of the uh, time, et cetera. But the results won't change. OK, I stop here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. The discussion is pain. This one, no, okay, this one. So it's, it's pain, not this one. That's Ping okay. Wang. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so earlier, you know, uh, Albert was talking about you know this kind of dangerous mix. You know, I'm right now in the in the dangerous mix trap. Um, a macro person. Now I need to discuss an empirical driven micro paper, basically. So so this is going to be tough. So I decided not even to bother to write down anything, which is even more dangerous. So everything is going to be in this piece. <laughs> so you have no hard evidence, basically. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's right. All right. So, so you know, this uh, paper, you know, uh, tried to discuss a very interesting issue, which is, you know, like, a, you, know, you know, this inland uh, land, land supply policy. And then try to argue, you know, if you use this one as instrument to proxy for the uh, housing price, and, and you know, this housing price increase in China may actually lead to higher wage rate, and then reduce the competitiveness of the Chinese industries. Okay, so uh, I would divide, you know, everything into two parts. Although there's no discussion of of the theory, uh, but you know, there is a, a very fundamental model there and the, the kind of cute model there, but I have to, uh, to quickly advise the authors, you know, just to be sure when writing up the paper more formally, and the, the theory part should be better linked with the empirical part. Right now, I cannot see the link much, okay? That's the theory can fit into anything, basically, okay? But I would like to talk about theory in terms of conceptual frameworks. Uh, I view these issues more important to think about more like misallocation issues. Why the central government should misallocate, so should allocate the land in this particular way? Why? Are there any misallocation because of that? Rather than just thinking about, you know, how this policy may, may affect things in a, in a very partial equilibrium way, right? So, 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 so this misallocation will create a wedge, and this wedge will have different variation in different sectors and in different regions. And then such kind of variation may not be good. And, uh, what should happen there? So this is the, the, the first conceptual framework. And second, second thing is, I would like to think about people are different. And uh, then, if you do have higher cost of living in urban area, that's a, you know, that should be a good selection mechanism. That basically says, if you are willing to move to urban, you would better be good. So this naturally serves as a selection mechanism, picking up better people moving to urban area. This selection mechanism may not be bad indeed. Okay, so cost of living need not be bad. And, uh, and also, uh, I, think, I think probably Chris or somebody raised this issue earlier. You know, this productivity is not really exogenous. The productivity is really endogenous. So if we do have, you know, firm upgrading, and if we do have FDI, you know, uh, attracting in, this, you know, this wage 
cheap labor may not be everything to talk about China. And what do we mean about too early to upgrade? Okay, you know, this is a very loose statement, right? Everybody can say that it's too early, right? But we, we, we need very concrete evidence, okay? So at, at least from the theory point of view, I will point out, your, you know, those three issues. And the, 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 all three issues will interact. And when they interact, it could be very important. Okay, so, so that's on the theory part. And the empirical part, I agree, you know, based upon the data uh, the order is using, you know, I mean, there's no uh, rent price ratio. But there, there is a household finance survey data, which if you would not mind just use nine province, you know, just to check. The rent price variation between the, uh, you know, different cities in the nine, pro the, the nine province turned out to be pretty big. And uh, indeed, uh, based upon uh, Yong Heng Deng's paper, you know, you know, you know, this, you know, this actually talked a lot about, you know, like, you know, uh, the, you know, the owner-occupied houses and also the, 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 the booming of each, you know, different cities there, okay. So, so that could be important to check because if this is important, you would think housing price would, would affect those, uh, you know, like, you know, uh, owner-occupied people more than, than, than rental. Okay, then rentees. And the second thing is, uh, although the other try to do something, trying to say, uh, you know, this uh, land supply quota policy is kind of exogenous, uh, I, I think Lauren, you know, uh, pointing out something my belayed uh, colleague Douglas North always like to say, how would you be sure those policies would be endogenous? You know, wouldn't be endogenous, right? And, uh, but even beyond that, a lot of controls to me are indulgence variables, okay? So, employment density, why does should be exogenous, right? So, there are many other con control variables, you know, which are really indulgence variables there. So, that should be taken care, I think. I'm not an empirical person, so maybe, maybe I'm totally wrong. And the thirdly, you know, uh, I would also like to see, um, you know, how these variations can really capture exactly the, the channel the order claim, which is from land supply to, to, to housing price and then to, to wage, right? Because during the same period, 2003, it's a big year, right? That's one year after WTO. It is also, you know, like the, the year when we have huge relaxation of the hookah system, the, the so-called blue stamp type stuff. And then more importantly, land auction in big cities begin. They are, they are all very important. How can we be sure, you know, what the channel capture is, you know, is correct here? Thank you. Uh, given this is a dangerous mix, I let the uh, offer respond before he <laughs> um, forgets what was uh, being... You like to take all the question. Oh, okay, because I thought, um, because this is, uh, you don't have slide and everything you might want to. Okay, all right, that's fine. So, other questions? Yeah, I'll come from the macro side too. So, I guess the regression is just completely perplexing to me, which is that if I regress wages on GDP per capita and I have a Cobb-Douglas production function, I get the labor share, and all the other variables are insignificant. So I just, it's not that I, you know, wake up every morning and pray to the gods of the Cobb-Douglas production function, but I really don't know what's going on in that regression that I'm not just re recovering a labor share over and over again. And so I'd like to hear what exactly we think we're doing there. I have a more fundamental and uh, much less econometric -y question, which is, uh, the title of your paper, I think, was Housing Prices Threaten Competitiveness. And I take away from that the idea that if housing prices hadn't risen so fast, that China would have had a more competitive economy. But it seems to me that all sorts of things are happening endogenously to raise housing prices, wages, uh, GDP, uh, affect competitiveness. All these things are happening all at the same time. And I'm wondering, why did you draw that conclusion? that housing prices threaten competitiveness? No more comments? <laughs> 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 
So as far as I know, uh, well, so well, this, it's the central government who controls the land, uh, no, agricultural land and non-agricultural land total area, right? But it is up to the uh, uh, local government uh, who decides how to uh, put the, the you know urban land into different usages, residential land, uh, uh, and industrial land, and commercial land, etc. So and and at the local government level, actually that different uh, kind of alloc allocations to different land usages are sort of like endogenous. Um, so here it seems that whenever we talk about land, are you, this is more like clarification question. It's, are you talking about like this uh, uh, res residential land or are you talk about the total non-farming land? And, and, and if you think about this, if you are talking about this you know, uh, residential land within city, itself, you know, how do you address the, you know, again, the endogenized issue, right? given that it is a, a local government decision? Thank you. Um, thank you for all the uh, very challenging questions. Let me answer questions from backward. The land use structure, yes, land use structure itself is endogenously de determined by the local governments. So this is why I did not use the land use structure. I used the, uh, the share of the total land use quota or land supply at the city level in the uh, uh, total land supply or land use quota in that year, not the structure, because this number is determined by the uh, central government. The uh, second to the last question, which is competitiveness, as I said, I, I think if the wage growth is deviating from per capita GDP, which is a measurement of uh, labor productivity, this means that the competition will be lower because the productivity measured by per capita GDP would, is what laborers produce for the firms, and wage is what they pay. If the gap is shrinking, it means the profitability of the firms will be shrinking over time. So this is why I mean what I've seen is the uh, uh, loss of uh, competitiveness. If you look at, if you observe what, are, what is happening in China, in the coastal area, many firms are moving out of China because their productivity is given by the quality of labor, but wage growth has many uh, causes to, to, to grow, including the phenomenon I, I discussed here. Of course, also uh, because of other things discussed by uh, Professor Mengxing. So this is my answer to the second last. For what happened in the year 2003, uh, what I want to say is the change uh, and the difference between the inland province and the local and the eastern provinces is because of the land policy change. If you think there is other thing which will also cause the change in the year 2003, they could be possible. But let us think, how about the change in the auction? Auction listing, all these kind of things of uh, policy change appear everywhere. You don't have uh, evidence to say that uh, the listing and auction is more seriously uh, enforced in the, in, in the coastal area. I, I don't think this is the reason. What I can say is the difference between the coastal area and the inland area is only because of the relative change in the amount of the land supply. So that's my argument. Uh, the fourth question. Many control variable on the right hand side is endogenous. What I can do is to lack all the control variable on the right hand side by one year. This is what I'm doing in the paper. That's not enough. If you think that is not enough, we have a trade-off. If you do not control, it will make our instrument variable more possible to be correlated with the error term. So we have to control them. <laughs> but when we, have, when we control them, you could argue that maybe many things can be endogenously determined by the land policy. So this is what I can do here. Control them and lag them by one year. This is the best I can do. For the rent price uh, data, what I use is the housing price. As I know, there is no panel data at city level for 10 years across the year 2003 to address this is issue. So this is why I did not use rent. I know there is some rent data, but no such a long time and uh, across the whole nation. And uh, when I use housing price, I think I need to address two things. First, if I only assume that rent is highly correlated with housing price, that's not a big issue. Second, even if, even if highly correlated with uh, uh, 
housing price, I mean the rent is highly correlated with the housing price. If the correlation is not perfect, this is a measurement error issue, right? And instrumental variable use can you know, reduce the bias caused by measurement error issue, right? Uh, then misallocation. I totally agree that's this uh, thing, if I cite paper in misallocation, I can also put this research in the background of misallocation issue. Because in, in this uh, uh, paper, the story here is where we have productivity and growth potential, we restrict the resource supply, which is captured by land supply here. But in the places where they don't have competitiveness, we only use the land policy to encourage their development. If you go to China to observe, I can uh, summarize my <laughs> feedback just by two data. First is, everywhere, every county here in China has at least one industrial park. Second, by having more you know, land supply in the inland provinces, we have uh, new towns everywhere in China. Now, according to the statistics by the central government, the overall planned population of the new cities, only the planned population, is now 3.4 billion for the whole country. So this is, I can't cite this number because it's not related to my paper, but I just want to give you as an institutional background and the situation of, uh, of China. Thank you.